As a child of the 1970s, one of my favourite films of all time is The Great Escape. And I had plenty of opportunity to get to know, to like and love it, because, of course, it was on every Boxing Day in the 1970s and for quite a few years thereafter. And I was thinking of that film today, partly because as a country, we seem to be heading back to the 1970s, but also, of course, because what we're going to talk about today uh, is escaping fixed costs. So um, I shall be adopting the role of Dickie Attenborough. Paul, of course, will be Steve McQueen. But let's recap and talk, first of all, about what's coming down the, uh, down the tunnel uh, towards us at some rate of knots now. It's been a long time coming. Um, in effect, the uh, fixed cost proposals really got going in 2017. There was a consultation in 2019 and then the government's response in 2021. And what's proposed effectively is to roll out, using as a model, the scheme of fixed costs which apply to uh, fast track personal injury claims uh, across a much wider category of cases. And in particular terms, what it means is there will be fixed costs uh, for most money claims up to a value of about £100,000. Um, what we're going to do after this seminar is um, send out, um, probably in the next week or so, a paper that we've written on uh, some of the key aspects of fixed costs. Uh, but we'd just like to, I think, set out a few thoughts about the proposals overall. I think the first point to note is that the scheme or concept of fixed costs is not objectionable per se. If you were to say to a solicitor, your fixed cost for this particular case will be one million pounds. I don't think you'd get many people who'd quibble at that. Where it becomes more iniquitous is that often uh, the scheme of fixed costs uh, may not be adequate for the amount of work that is required to be done for a case. And more particularly, what we've noticed over the years is that very often figures in the rules um, tend to ossify and are not updated, reflect inflation, a very pressing uh, consideration at this time, or, or indeed also um, to reflect the way that working processes can change vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, the COVID pandemic and the move to paperless and remote working. So those are the sorts of issues that frame the context. Um, and what I'd like to talk about now, before I pass the baton over to Paul, is how it's going to work. In essence, there are three tables which will be introduced by a reform part 45 um, going forward. The first will relate to fixed recoverable costs in the fast track for all sorts of cases, which will be subdivided into band one, band two, band three or band four. And band one will be the very simple cases, debt cases, possibly credit hire cases too. Band four will be the more complicated cases. Um, that will then carry forward into what are called fixed recoverable costs for intermediate cases on the fast track. Uh, and again, these are going to be divided into four bands, band one being the very simple cases, bands two and three, complex and more complex cases, and band four, uh, the most complex cases. Then there'll be a, a separate table uh, for noise-induced hearing loss claims, but nothing as, as such um, uh, in relation to the other varieties of, uh, of industrial disease. Many cases um, which may fall within this by way of value will not actually be allocated to um, the, inter the, the intermediate bracket on the fast track uh, because they will have uh, allocation to the multi-track for other reasons. Uh, and one of those can be complexity, particularly in PI, uh, the sensitivity of, for example, particular types of cases, such as uh, claims for compensation for child abuse, um, and also uh, cases which might involve wider issues or matters of reputation and importance. But to put some flesh on the bones, if, for example, post April 2023, when these are meant to be brought in, um, you had a credit hire claim, damages of £30,000, uh, which concluded in a one-day trial, then the cost recoverable would be £13,450, including the trial fee for counsel. If you had a personal injury assessment of quantum in band four on the intermediate bracket of fast-track cases, 
uh, £50,000 value, concluding at a one-day trial, that would result in costs of £51,950, including council's fees. And if you go to the other end of the table, so that you have a band four case of £100,000 in value, which concludes at a three-day trial, then costs, including council, will be £68,450. So that's to give you just a flavour of what we're going to be grappling with. We don't have any draft rules at the moment, um, but I'll just pass the baton over to Paul to set out his opening thoughts on where we're going with this. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, it's appropriate, I think, at this stage, whilst we're on the subject of banding, to recognise that the concept of allocation, uh, fast track, small claims track, multi track, is, of course, something that we're all very used to in the course of our practice. We all have had to argue at one point or another that a case ought to be allocated to a track that our opponent disagrees with, whether that be claimant or defendant. Um, and whether those uh, objections are meritorious or otherwise. But the concept of banding within a track is a new one. And it's one that practitioners, I think, will have to get used to. And some might say it will be the new um, post-allocation argument. And one of the, uh, one of the, 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 the points, the first points to note about um, the fast track, at least, if the matter is allocated to the fast track, is that council's fees are ring-fenced. Only in band four, that is the most complicated band, or the, uh, the band for um, uh, employers' liability, disease, complex tract possession uh, uh, claims, housing disrepair claims, and some professional negligence claims, really towards the top end of the fast track. Um, and in NIHL claims, and of course, there's a separate grid prov provided for, for NIHL claims, which provided for specific costs and that varies depending upon the number of defendants. Now what the MOJ uh, anticipate, what the reforms anticipate, is that there will need to be early notification and agreement and the practice pre pre-action protocol will be amended to affect this uh, between the parties as to the appropriate tracking and also the appropriate banding within that track. And bearing in mind that the base costs vary and sometimes significantly, certainly in the intermediate cases, but also in uh, fast track cases between uh, bands one and band four, you might find yourself agreeing on track, but not upon banding. Now, the MOJ are going to leave this to the judiciary and the parties to sort out, but um, it would be foolhardy, I think, to expect there to be um, some sort of uh, a, 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 a constant cooperation between the parties, which would mean that this doesn't result in argument. One point that I'll move on to now, and this brings into um, focus uh, a number of different arguments, is what happens, or is really the notion of allocation and, and rebanding, uh, not rebranding, but re-rebanding, which uh, might, might become a, a phrase, but it might not. Um, now, the reforms anticipate that a band, once a band is, uh, once a, a case is allocated to a band within a track, it should be revisited only in exceptional circumstances. And those are the words that are used. Um, and on occasion, if substantial unfairness would be caused to one of the parties. Now, one assumes that the words exceptional circumstances uh, as a condition for rebanding will make their ways into the rule, make, make their way into the rules, but we simply don't know. Um, certainly, it's a concept with which we're all familiar uh, with 4529J. Um, but what about arguments at the end of a case? And we'll come on to this when we deal with um, potential problems with uh, uh, misbanding, as it were, or banding that was in, deemed inappropriate by one of the parties to the case. If the claimant's overcomplicated the claim and it's allocated to the wrong band as a result, does the court then reallocate or reband the case? Or is it possible to limit at the end of the case uh, the claimant via 4411 or some other mechanism to the costs of a different band? Well, we take the view that the probable result of this is going to be a reduction, obviously, in detailed assessments. That's whole, one of the um, undoubted aims of um, fixed costs to predict costs and provide that costs are 
um, proportionate to damages. But it might mean that there are costs arguments at the end of a case. Um, so it may be that at the conclusion of a trial, the trial judge has run out of time, but the court wants to hear on a separate occasion arguments about um, limitation of costs to other bands within the track, much as um, there are now arguments or can, there are arguments of Bernard Hudson, Drew and Whitbread um, for cases that go to court or settle um, in relation where, where there's an order for detailed assessment as to whether or not fast track costs ought to apply or otherwise. And we may see a resurgence of those arguments. Now, I should say that it's relevant at this point to note that in the fast track, a, an unsuccessful band challenge brings with it the costs liability of £150. So that will be £150 each uh, as a fixed, uh, as a fixed uh, penalty, as it were. Originally, that was going to be £300. It still is in the intermediate cases, but not in the fast track. Now, that's not a substantial cost risk um, in circumstances in which the benefit to be gained from a rebanding might be significant. So one anticipates that there may be some um, uh, some uh, uh, arguments there. Now, finally, um, on on this point, um, the uh, despite there being calls for how to uh, for further guidance on how to um, allocate a case within a, a banding, because there will be some cases that fall within a normal band two or a normal band three, because they are categorised within the table as either a a package holiday claim or a housing disrepair claim for band three, but they may seem to be, they may be deemed to be either less complicated or more complicated than um, others within the same basket. Um, despite there being guide, uh, for calls for guidance as to uh, how to, how to band or how to appropriate band a case, um, there hasn't been any um, given. And one of the points that was raised by some of the consultees was uh, whether or not in a case in which fundamental dishonesty was raised at a late stage by a defendant, that would cause a rebanding, because of course it would make the claim, the claim more complicated. And um, the, uh, the consultation response was that we don't need to address that at this stage. We're not going to provide further um, guidance because uh, just as we can avoid um, reallocation by the good use of the judiciary's discretion, so we can with banding. Um, I, I'll leave Andrew now to, to talk a little bit about the other changes that, 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 that are, are coming in. And in particular, one of the ones that, that, that interests us is um, the effect of Part 36 and conduct, which I can also address with him in due course. But those are this is a, a, another concept with which we'll have to become familiar. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that struck me is that when um, you look at the what we do know of the rules, because there are no draft rules at the moment. It's almost as if conflict is being built into them. And let me just give you a couple of examples of that. Um, the first point to note is that, as Paul says, you can have a real battle over allocation, with a, with a, not only within track, but within band within the track. And you can do it cheaply. So the question is, well, why wouldn't we do it? Another example, if you look at the table that has been provided, is just to consider the difference between costs recovered on an unissued claim and costs on an issued claim. So if you take um, a band one claim in the lowest level of the intermediate cases on the fast track, if you settle pre-issue, the recoverable costs are £1,400 plus 3% of damages, but the day after you issue, and up until the first CMC, or the CMC, I should say, the costs recoverable become £3,500 plus 10% of damages. <laughs> so I can see a lot of potential uh, for conflict there about uh, and the old style premature issue argument, which we're probably all familiar with. Another aspect uh, is, of course, um, to consider how this is sort of going to play out. And um, what, what I did note was that um, if you look at the Civil Procedure Rules Committee minutes from the summer, and I'll just read a paragraph from it, there's a very interesting take on how these rules are going to be drafted and structured uh, when they're produced. And it says this in paragraph 21, the work thus far has highlighted some drafting issues. The existing structure of part 45 is not ideal for the lay reader, 
mainly in part 45, but other parts too. It has evolved in stages over time, with new elements being added on in a rather piecemeal way, which has unfortunate consequences in terms of clarity of drafting. Well, that doesn't bode well for the new set of rules, really, does it? Because what they're proposing to do is to bolt things onto part 45 rather than start a start afresh. But if we consider how this will relate to other issues, one of the points we're going to look at when we go down um, the routes, the escape routes, of which there are quite a few, actually, um, part 36 is going to be one of them. But again, one wonders how, for example, defendants' costs are going to be dealt with in these cases, where, for example, the Quox simplicities of a personal injury case don't apply. Are we going to have a situation where defendants' costs are the same as a claimant's, or are they dealt with in the way that they're dealt with under the existing Part 45, and in effect capped at what would be a claimant's uh, level of recovery? No one knows at the moment, or at least it's not apparent from the documents. I should also say this, we're really pleased to see that we've got 830 of you online. It's wonderful to see all your little faces uh, staring out at us from the screen. You know, it's like the Muppet Show in a sense, in reverse. But um, we haven't had any questions yet or any conversation in the chat. Please don't feel all 830 of you, you have to pose a question. But do feel free to ask any questions as we go along. And what we'll do is we'll try and sweep them up in a riff as we go through the, the other individual um, topics. Um, so in a sense, um, what we can see coming down the, the track is fundamental change, fundamental change for that vast tranche of litigation of up to £100,000. And already, not knowing the detail of the rules, um, the potential for conflict right at the beginning, but also conflict right at the end. Some of you will remember um, that uh, a case called Voice Script International. Now, the issue in that case, a long time ago, was somebody managed to get a case onto a cost-bearing track by pleading this, that, and the other. When the matter was sorted out and the case concluded, the case was worth much less and indeed would have fallen within the small claims track um, level. So the argument at the conclusion was, you don't get your costs because this was and always should have been a small claim. And so you're going to have that sort of argument in a case on band four. Oh, no, no, no. We now know at the end of the case, this was and always should have been uh, a case on band one. Which brings me to the first question for which I thank <coughs> the author. Can we confirm which band credit hire is likely to be placed in? Well, I'm afraid that's band one. That we do know. So um, let's... Uh, Let's shall we move on, Paul, because we've got quite a bit. To get there's to on there's the... just another um, another question, I think, uh, which yes. was, is Clinag covered? Um, and the answer to that is no, it's not. Um, the uh, CJC, uh, as part of um, Sir Rupert Jackson's recommendations, a working group was commissioned um, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> by the CJC to... Um, implement a bespoke process for work for uh, clinic neck cases up to £25,000. So that has been um, excluded from these rules. So I just try, sorry to interrupt, I was just uh, answering that other question that, that arose. No, no, no I, I can see, Paul, they're coming thick and fast now. Um, and um, my Lord, they're popping up all over the place. One of the points that was raised is, is there going to be a review of allowable disbursements and quantum of disbursements? Uh, including the recoverability of translator and interpreter fees. We're actually going to have a look at that when we come on to um, vulnerability as one of the potential escape routes. But, um, you know, we've only got another 40 minutes remaining, so we better get going, Paul. Um, so we talk about route one, contracting out before dispute arises? Yes, um, I think uh, one of the points that... that, that um, everybody will be interested in is whether or not um, there are mechanisms whereby um, we can or you can uh, get out of the fixed recoverable costs regime before the um, regime applies. And there's no um, reason why that um, cannot um, happen. One of the, the, the two potential routes, um, the, the, the two most common um, avenues whereby there'll be a contract entered into that causes the dispute to be to, to, to fall outside of the fixed triple cost regime 
are likely to be um, in property litigation. Of course, property litigation now covered on the fast track um, by the fixed recoverable costs regime and expressly um, oh, housing district power matters expressly referred to in the consultation document and response. And of course, there is often um, in relation to disputes over a lease or in relation to a mortgage, a clause which requires or permits one or both parties to recover their costs on an indemnity basis. And of course, we know from recent Court of Appeal case in Doyle and MD Foundations that costs on a standard basis or an indemnity basis are different um, in nature to fixed costs. Uh, and so um, insofar as there are agreements between the parties prior to a um, dispute coming before the court, which would ordinarily be the subject of fixed costs, um, that um, those contractual clauses can be relied upon. There may also be um, uh, cases in contract, insurance contracts and the like, in which there are uh, the parties have signed up to uh, provision for dispute resolution clause, provisions which include uh, the resolution of disputes via um, arbitration, um, either via the Arbitration Act uh, 1996 or, or, or some other um, dispute resolution mechanism, which might include costs. Um, and those costs will, of course, not be the subject of fixed costs. So it is possible for parties to contract out before a dispute. And of course, um, I think I'll pass this on to Andrew uh, afterwards as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I agree because in a sense, the, the, the obvious focus of these costs are going to be tort claims. Because if you've got a lease or a mortgage which says, you know, the loser pays the winner's costs on an indemnity basis, that will displace the fixed costs. And Paul's absolutely right that um, insurance policies often have arbitration clauses. There are other um, types of uh, contract which, uh, again, have a similar clause which deal with the cost. And, and it's entirely possible that you could, when drafting standard terms, put in a clause in a contract which doesn't normally have that clause, provided it's even handed and would apply to both parties. You're unlikely to infringe the Consumer Rights Act, for example, uh, unless, of course, you try and load it so that it's the consumer who pays on the indemnity basis, whereas the defendant will pay on the fixed cost basis. That won't work. But um, in a sense, that's the first route out, which is sort it out in a contract beforehand. The second option um, is, of course, that you can contract out of fixed costs after uh, the dispute has actually arisen. Often it has to be said people do this inadvertently. Um, and you have a sort of battle of the contracts or a question of construction of what a Part 36 offer means. But if we think of the original Ho and Adelican case, that was a question of contracting out, really. Uh, and also the more recent case, uh, which Kevin Latham did of Doyle and M&D Foundations, was a question of contracting out through the terms of an agreed order, a consent order. So it can be done. Uh, would parties do it deliberately? Well, they may as part of a bit of hard bargaining, if a case is going to be inevitably going towards the multi-track, but you want to knock it on the head for reasons A, B and C uh, at an early stage, even if it is possibly notionally subject to, to fixed costs. So um, I, I, I think that, you know, in, in effect, that's the first two routes. You can contract out before you get going and you can contract out as part of the settlement, but there are others. Um, perhaps if I pass the button back to you, Paul, while I just quickly read some of these questions. I, I, I was doing um, uh, exactly the same. Um, one of the other routes that, um, that, that I suppose this is less a, uh, a, a movement out of fixed costs, but more um, a question as to what is or is not included within fixed costs, is whether or not um, things like... Um, agency fees are included within the fixed cost regime so i've done an awful lot of cases dealing with medical agency fees and whether or not agency fees uh, are recoverable in the fixed cost regime um, uh, in order to obtain um, uh, medical reports as opposed to medical records initially a case called beardmore which dealt with medical records but in the um uh, elpl process after the, the elpl protocol rather than the rta protocol but also now the, uh, there's a dispute about whether or not they're recoverable in uh, in relation to medical reports. So 
that um, uh, uh, has yet to be the subject of um, uh, uh, any sort of seniorly senior authority judicial determination. But that all that question will undoubtedly also apply um, in relation to other. Uh, uh, fees that at the moment, and we all know Aldred and Chan, uh, Chan are, uh, are either to be sought under the all-embracing 4529I2H, any particular particular feature of a dispute, or they are to be specifically referenced. What the uh, recommend, what the uh, um, uh, MOJ have said about um, about disbursements like um, interpreters fees is that there will need to be an amendment to include um, provision for uh, those types of fee as disbursements. Um, it, that is unsurprising after a case that um, Master Campbell did, I think as a deputy master, uh, although I can't recall the name of it now, um, when uh, uh, it, when he dealt with whether or not interpreters fees were recoverable or not within the fixed recoverable cost regime and whether or not they um, arose from a particular feature of the dispute or a particular feature of the claimant. That will probably be um, clarified, although it's by no means um, by no means certain. Uh, that also brings into uh, point, I think, brings into uh, focus the question of vulnerability and whether or not um, that is an exception to the fixed recoverable cost regime or whether or not it in fact is um, likely to be uh, a percentage uplift. There is a, a, a healthy section on that within the report. So I think, Andrew, uh, perhaps move on to that now to um, address vulnerability, which obviously has a real part to play in um, in current litigation. Yeah. Um, there's quite a few questions about housing disrepair in, in, in the Q&A and how, how this is going to be dealt with. Um, it's 20 odd years, I think, since I used to do housing disrepair, landlord and tenant disputes. But I remember quite well the sort of clients who brought those cases. And um, many of them were semi-literate at best, illiterate at most. Many of them didn't speak English. Um, they were all people who would nowadays be described as vulnerable. And indeed, there are many other categories of vulnerable uh, claimant. To give you an example, um, many elderly people um, many people who are um, subject to uh, disabilities. Uh, and I would also include people who um, don't have English as a language that they can comfortably use in the county court. Now, um, if you consider just a couple of years ago, the Civil Justice Council published a report called Vulnerable Witnesses and Parties. That led to a series of reforms in 2021. And I would commend for your consideration uh, Rule 1.6 of the CPR and Practice Direction 1A, because what that means is that when the court manages a case or makes a decision on a case, they need to take into account someone's vulnerability. Uh, and of course, there can be cost consequences for that. So um, in a Civil Justice Council report, um, which I've just referred to, what it expressly um, contemplates is that you will have escape clauses in the rules so that you can ask for further and more costs if you're dealing with someone who is vulnerable. Now, it seems to me that if you wanted a couple of obvious examples as to what that sort of cost would be, it would be the cost of doing a home visit to someone because you need to go and see them to take instructions properly and they can't come to you. Um, and it may well be that they are part of the significant segment of this country that doesn't have access to the internet. Uh, another example, if you have to um, instruct an interpreter in order to get someone to understand um, their case and how it needs to be put, let alone give evidence in court, I see no reason why those fees can't be recovered uh, under the vulnerable um, uh, uh, provisions contained immediately in the CPR, but also to be um, employed under 45.29J. And indeed, I did a case earlier this year where we got back more by way of costs under 45.29J, because the client was elderly, housebound and suffering from dementia. So vulnerability, I think, is going to be a big escape route. Um, and it means something that has to be considered carefully, not in a knee-jerk formulaic way, whereby you're looking just to the cost for the, uh, the sake of it, but by saying to yourself, what do you need to spend in order to ensure that this client plays a meaningful role in their own case?
So I think vulnerability is going to be a big escape route. Um, I'm not sure where we're up to on that. I think we've done, is it four so far? Yeah, still. A yeah, I, I think on, um, we haven't done um, dealt with part 36 yet. I think on vulnerability, um, within the response, um, the, there's, there's a specific mention of there being, um, the, obviously there's 4529J, which can um, provide you with an escape route, um, as well as those obvious escape routes. So I suppose and we haven't talked about Ferry and Gill, but that's the leading authority on that at the moment. But it, it, it's very much the exception rather than the rule, if you'll avo avoid, uh, uh, forgive the pun. Um, that that an application <coughs> under 4529J succeeds. But there's specific mention within the response document to um, the availability potential of um, a 25% uplift on fixed renewable costs for those who have difficulty giving instructions as a result of a med verified me me mental impairment, which um, is, uh, as I understand it, um, uh, um, uh, not defined, but... Um, it requires difficulty giving instructions. There to be a mental disorder, which is then um, uh, uh, verified by a medical report or a psychologist or psychiatrist. And that um, potential uplift um, the government proposes of 25% insofar as it can be established is obviously reflective of a, uh, an uplift that would um, compensate vulnerability within the context of fixed recoverable costs rather than needing to get out of it by 4529J, but um, as I understand it, that's uh, a, a point that is being considered because in the proposal, the, the closing words within that uh, paragraph are the government will discuss arrangements for this with the CPRC in due course. So it, that is not a, as, it seems to me that that's probably not as fait, a fait accompli as um, the bandings and the allocation, but it's something that is obviously being considered. So it may be that there's no need for a 4529J application on the grounds of vulnerability if um, there is sufficient compensation provided by the uplift. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting point, isn't it? Because if you're saying that someone needs um, to recover more by way of cost because of their own particular condition, it seems to gel um, that they should get more costs. But then it seems to jar that you say, well, there's an arbitrary uplift on top because, you know, maybe it's enough, maybe it's not enough. But you're departing from the swings and roundabouts model at that stage. So there's some difficulty there. I think also one of the points which has been raised, which is an interesting one, um, is whether qualified one way cost shifting is also going to be extended beyond PI if on the other side of the coin, fixed costs are being extended beyond PI. And the answer to that, I'm afraid, is not on your nelly, not under this government, um, which would regard qualified one way cost shifting either as being an undue burden on business or, of course, something uh, which will adversely affect the government or the various emanations of the state, who are, of course, one of the biggest tort feasers um, going. So I think I think the answer to that is no, that will have to wait for a change in government um, if it's going to happen at all. As a sidewind, I should say that there was an attempt to judicially review the government uh, for failing to bring in qualified one-way cost shifting for claims under the Equality Act. Uh, that was uh, defeated, um, but that was a few years ago. And I can't see that anything's happened um, to take it forward uh, since that point. So the questions are coming again thick and fast. Somebody says to me, um, are we really only going to get 3,250 quid for a band one uh, fast track uh, credit hire case? And the answer to that is not quite. Um, one of the points that we should make is that these fees are the, the fees set in 2017 in the consultation. They will be uplifted for inflation. But these days, given that so many credit hire claims uh, seem to end up on the small claims track, that might be thought to be generous in some quarters. I think the highest I've ever seen is a district judge allocating a £35,000 credit hire claim to the small claims track on the basis that um, we do these all the time. So um, there we are. Um, any, any of the questions spark your interest, Paul? Yeah, just on that inflation point, um, I spoke to you about this uh, earlier on. Um, <clears throat> as you will know, the... SPPI um, 
uh, uh, inflationary increase. I think some one of the questions that I've seen, I keep on reaching here to my screen so I can go. One of the uh, questions I've seen is, is the SPPI fl- applicable to fast track costs as well as intermediate case costs? So, so we're going to come up with a, a nomenclature for that at some point, but it, at, at the moment it, they're in, it's intermediate cases on the fast track. Um, the answer is yes, it, it is. And as to what sort of inflationary increase that will be, um, if you were to take, uh, I looked at the SPPI index, and if you were to take Q2 uh, 2017, which the figures were based upon, to Q3 2022, um, the increase uh, over that period is about just under 14%. So uh, it is likely, uh, although th- this is not, um, I'm not part of the committee, of course, that's going to uh, set the increase, but it's likely if they follow the SPPI aggregates, which is uh, an aggregate across all of the, um, all, all of the service provision uh, index increases, um, then the likely, aggr- the ag- likely increase is going to be, well, I would have thought, um, in excess of 13%. And it's increasing at an exponential rate, of course, as the inflationary um, the inflationary increases are uh, get get greater. It was largely static for the period up to 2018, but um, after 2018, it, it's run high. So uh, that's a little factor that, that that's one worth looking out for. And of course, on the big cases, you know that makes nine thousand pounds worth of difference for um, base costs on intermediate cases. So the figures are representative, um, but the difference between them is likely to get wider as the inflationary increases are applied. We'll see where inflation's going. Um, we've not had a good couple of months in that respect, um, but may, maybe that the new prime minister will be able to calm things down, or maybe not. Um, but of course, that should be reflected in the figures, and perhaps more widely, there needs to be a process for uplifting these figures, certainly in the next few years going forward. But do bear in mind, of course, that as we enter 2023, we're meant to be getting a new set of guideline hourly rates as well, as the current set are only meant to have a two-year shelf life means to be seen whether that happens. So shall we move on to part 36 offers, Paul? Mm. Yeah. Yes. Um, part, if I set the ball rolling, some of you will remember, in fact, we'll deal with on a regular basis, the case of Broadhurst and Town. That went to the Court of Appeal a few years back. And the issue in the case was, if a claimant beats their own part 36 offer at trial, do they get a hybrid award of costs, i.e. you know, fixed costs up to a certain point, and then 21 days from the um, uh, the, the uh, Part 36 offer, they get indemnity costs. And the Court of Appeal said yes. Well, that's to go. Um, that will be part of the reform. So it will go across the board for PI as well as non-PI. But Part 36 will remain. And if you beat a Part 36 uh, offer at trial, your own Part 36 offer at trial, then you get a flat rate 35% uplift on the fixed recoverable costs which is not a small amount of money by anyone's stretch of imagination uh, as you look at the higher bands, but of course is meant to introduce a bit more certainty into the process so that people will be well aware of what the pros and cons are of not beating someone's Part 36 offer. It's funny, but on a lot of cases that go to trial, um, it still seems to be an exception rather than the rule that the claimant beats their own Part 36 offer. And I don't know why that is, um, because Part 36 takes on a particular importance when one's litigating in a fixed cost world. But it may be that people start to look at how they, they calculate their Part 36 offers a bit more carefully. And it may well be that defendants will have to think a bit more carefully uh, about the claimant's Part 36 offers uh, when considering uh, settlement and settlement uh, before trial. So um, that's the, in a nutshell um, what's going to happen. Paul, what's what's your take on Part 36 going forward? Well, um, it's, it's going to be a, a, a new world where by um, the percentage uplift is fixed at a level which the MOJ take uh, the view will compensate uh, the successful party less than an uplift by way of indemnity basis costs on standard basis costs would would um, would compensate them. So effectively, the the benefit to be gained um, is likely to be less from the point of view of the MOJ than uh, than was previously the case with the benefit of indemnity costs and all of the all of the um, Part Thirty Six additional uh, benefits. 
but um, it, 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 it doesn't, um, one thing that the rules are, uh, or the, the, the proposals um, are absent on, as Andrew said, is um, what happens to a defendant's cost. So what happens in the event that a defendant beats its own Part 36 offer? Um, it, it, is it going to be the case that, firstly, uh, as in 4529H at the moment, the claimants, the defendant's costs will be effectively capped at the amount which would be payable to the claimants at the stage of beating its own offer. Um, capped, I say, rather than assessed at, because that's the way the rules are drafted at the moment. Um, uh, and the, are those costs then to be the subject of a Part 36 increase of 35%? Or will it operate in the way that Part 36 um, does at the moment, which is that they don't get any Brucey bonus, but they do get their costs. Um, it will be a win for defendants if the result of um, the Part 36, the 30, if the change from indemnity costs to Part 36 um, uh, uh, with a 35% increase also applies to them. Um, and I'm not clear as to whether or not, whether, whether it will or not, we'll have to wait and see what the rules say. But if the, um, and one assumes that um, there's going to have to be an amendment to, to part 36 to facilitate um, this. But that's one of the points to look out for. And if you're a defendant, it's probably one of the points to, to, to think about because it makes it much more attractive to make a part 36 offer if you're going to get an uplift on your costs, which you previously did not. One of the other um, points, and that's Andrew's got something else, something else about um, part 36 itself, is that one of the linked points to part 36, um, and um, it's an even more um, uh, attractive bonus um, it, it, it is in circumstances in which the, the court finds that there are, well, so I should say about Part 36, that it applies only, of course, to the stage at which the expiry of the offer is made, it, it occurs, sorry. But in relation to what I'm about to say, that limitation does not apply. It's a matter of entire judicial discretion. And that's the concept of unreasonable conduct. Now, we all know um, it loosely what unreasonable conduct um, may be, um, but it is a, a, a malleable concept and one that the uh, MOJ are not keen to define any further than leaving it to the judiciary and the good sense of the parties to recognise what it is. Well, given that the consequence of a finding of unreasonable conduct is a 50% increase on fixed recoverable costs, to whichever stages of the um, litigation the judge finds appropriate, and it seems to be an open discretion, um, then uh, there may well be um, a new uh, 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 sphere of argument which revolves around um, the application of this, these provisions. Now, as regards what unreasonable behaviour is, um, in the consultation document, um, it's expressly said they don't, the MHA don't propose to give a view, um, although they do refer to Dammerman and Lanyon Bowdler, which case concerning unreasonable conduct in the context of 2714, which itself referred back to Ride Arch and Horsfield, the concept of unreasonableness within, unreasonableness within um, wasted cost orders. So it may be that that gives an indication as to what sort of conduct will be required. Not unreasonable, but unreasonable to a great degree. Suddenly sounds a lot like indemnity costs, doesn't it? Um, it may be that conduct permitting of a no reasonable explanation is the sort of test that will apply. Who knows? But it is certainly um, uh, a point for um, paying part. Well, I suppose a point for um, um, uh, receiving parties to consider as to whether or not that argument can and will be deployed. It doesn't also. Also, I should say, um, on the part of linked with my my uh, my point about my concerns about Part Thirty Six, it doesn't easily. Um, apply to defendants' costs, but if Part 36, the Part 36 uplift does, then there's no reason why unreasonable behaviour um, would not as well. And suddenly, we're looking at a, a far, uh, might say, a club as a defendant, a far more level playing field as far as us are concerned. I, I think unreasonable behaviour. This this idea that you can allege your opponent has been guilty of unreasonable behaviour and get a 50% uplift on your fixed recoverable costs if the judge finds that that's well-founded, um, is going to throw petrol on the fire of satellite litigation. And just to give you a couple of examples, 
suppose you write to your opponent and say, we're going to go to trial in this case, but we want a mediation. And uh, here's three mediators. You might have your own suggestions. We'll have a look at them. But let's have a mediation. And then your opponent is immediately on the horns of a dilemma. Because if they say no, they have to explain why not. And the zeitgeist is such that people should be looking at ADR. And if they don't mediate and they don't have cogent reasons, they're going to get hammered, I think, under the unreasonable behaviour point. I keep coming back to credit hire. It's a subject which haunts my dreams, I have to admit, to a certain extent. But if I was a credit hire company or credit hire claimant firm, I'd write to the defendant and say, we've got these 20 cases against you. Why don't we have a mediation and see if we can hammer them all out over the course of a day? Uh, course of a day. What do you say in relation to that? And if they say no, they have to come up with very good reasons why they say no. Let, let me give you another example where I think this is going to, um, to happen. A lot of people um, are quite adept at writing self-serving correspondence. They create a paper trail where they're trying to show a judge at some later point, if necessary, that they've behaved ultra reasonably in the context of this case. Often those letters are not responded to or not responded to timiously. And again, if you can show, for example, that someone is delaying dealing with matters so that costs are being incurred, um, it may be quite a th high threshold, but you may be getting to the point where if you can throw in a few breaches of the protocol as well or failing in the procedural timetable, are you going to approach this threshold of unreasonable behaviour? Or, and, and this is why I like your reference to the, the Ride Howl case, Paul, is it so high that it's got to be conduct that is so unreasonable, it's conduct which permits of no reasonable explanation at all, which is a very difficult test um, for someone to meet. But I think um, if we were looking at conflict, um, then, then that, that is something um, that, that, that will, will fuel it. Now, there is a question in the chat, which I simply have to answer. It's been written by a cost lawyer, which asks directly, is he going to lose his job as a result of these reforms? And the answer to that is no. And I, I'll tell you why. I'm sufficiently old that I remember when we had fixed costs pre-CPR uh, under the county court rules. And if it was a scale one case, you got a certain amount. But there was always embodied in those county court rules the facility for a discretion. And because there was a gateway for a discretion, it was used routinely on every case to ask for an uplift within the scheme of county court rules as then, as then applied. Uh, and so it is here. Let me give you an example. Suppose you have a case which doesn't go to issue. It settles uh, before issue. Is it band one, band two, band three or band four? Well, it may be obviously band one, but with many cases, there'd be a real issue as to whether it's band two, band three or band four. So there will be an application. There will be an argument as to where um, the, 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 the costs fall. And what that means to my mind is that uh, cost lawyers, cost draftsmen, will have to evolve from being creatures of number looking at quantification of bills, quantification of budgets, to being creatures of words, structuring arguments, using authorities and making submissions as to why your case falls within one particular part of the table as opposed to another particular part of the table. But that is still very much a skilled job, uh, but it's a very different job uh, from having to grapple with Excel spreadsheets. But we're now entering the last... Um, 10 minutes or so of the um, talk. And I don't think, Paul, we've really grappled with exceptional circumstances and fairy <laughs> and Bill yet. So do you want to kick off on that? Yeah, um, one, one point that just one question that's, um, that oh, I, uh, I've noticed in the chat is how do you deal with banding disputes on cases which settle pre-issue? Which actually is a very good case, a good, a good question because the complexity band um, uh, uh, varies, uh, although it does not, if it's band one, the case settles um, the, the up to £25,000, the fixed costs of £500. For bands two, three and four, it changes depending upon the value of the case. I suspect the answer to that question will be determined by an amendment to the pre-action protocol, which, which is going to provide for the parties to agree 
banding or in, uh, uh, in, in a case in which um, pre-issue cases, or sorry, in a pre-issue case, um, and then the appropriate um, uh, 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 cost will apply. Um, although, obviously, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not clear on that. I don't know whether you've got a view on that, Andrew. Not really, Paul. I think it's one of these issues that are sort of floating about. Um, and, and um, you know, you, could, you, could, you can and will look at it from both, both ends of the telescope, effectively, I think. Yeah, well, fair, well moving on then, just, uh, yeah, 10 minutes left. Ferry and Gill. Um, 4529J is expressly being preserved. Um, and it has been the subject of uh, many uh, an application in the county court, uh, very few applications on appeal, although um, uh, you will no doubt know of some that have been put on uh, various websites. Um, and um, the uh, uh, application of the law, um, it's fair to say, is not necessarily always entirely consistent. And what uh, uh, the factors that the courts consider uh, seem to be all of those factors that um, would uh, ordinarily be considered when one comes to consider the 26, the rules and the, sorry, the, the factors in um, CPR 44.4. Um, Ferry and Gill um, is, a case, is a, an authority which, whilst um, setting out uh, a uh, set of general principle that the bar is not to be set too low um, is in fact difficult to apply in um, in every case because of course what you have to uh, satisfy the court is that it is exceptional in the context of the uh, basket of cases that comes before the court for that type of um, uh, that type of claim and um, it, it, it is difficult to um, to, to, to jump that hurdle in most cases. In fact, it's as I say, it's the, it's the exception rather than the rule. Um, it may be that there are other mechanisms whereby um, costs can be achieved or the, the fixed recoupable cost regime can be um, enhanced, as it were, perhaps by reference to unreasonable behaviour um, or, or, or you know, uh, as I say, a Part 36 offer rather than relying upon exceptional circumstances. Um, it, it is, I think we agree, a, a sort of provision that is ripe for um, revision. Um, but it, it's difficult to see um, how any flesh can be added to the bones, certainly within the context of the current, um, of the current regime. I don't anticipate there'll be anything added to it in the new one. Uh, the proposals seem to anticipate that it'll simply apply uh, as, it, as it does now. And one assumes, therefore, that it will be in the event that you satisfy the, the court, there will be an order for standard basis costs and the 20 percent um, provision will still apply. I don't know what, what your views on that are, Andrew, but that seems to be my impression. Well, I, I don't know. I don't understand why the county court judges are so shy of finding exceptional circumstances, because they must have many cases that come in front of them which demonstrate bad litigation behaviour or where serious allegations of fraud and fundamental dishonesty aren't made out at trial. But they, they, it does seem, you get this feeling that exceptional circumstances costs are reserved for God and the angels. They're not to be given to mere solicitors um, litigating in the county court. But I, I do think that Ferry and Gill is ripe for reconsideration because it adds this, this, this extra layer of lacquer or varnish on what is a very simple provision. If on the facts of this case, you think there are exceptional circumstances, um, then you can award more by way of cost. Why do you have to start unpicking what are the features of a basket of typical cases in a methodical uh, fashion in the way that the judgment accepts, when by nature you're going to be making a, a fact specific decision, taking into account a broad range of um, matters? So I think exceptional circumstances may continue to be um the, the 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 sort of fallback escape route uh, but there are others as we've already discussed um today and i think that um when you look at it um what the court is 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 hoping if if, if the purpose of these fixed costs is to remove the transactional costs of calculating and resolving the costs after the action it's going to fail because you're building in conflict into this new system which is going forward. And I think we've already touched upon how 
you know, there, there, there's so much scope for dispute over which bits of fixed costs you get that you're simply going to move the, 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 um, the disputes into a different arena and they will continue. Um, there is a final root pool, which we've not touched upon, which I think we could just throw out there really as a piece mm -hmm. of mystery. Does it really matter after Belsner if, in fact, you are charging your client on the traditional hourly rate basis and simply regard these fixed costs as a useful, um, a useful addition um, to the cost that the client has to pay you? Well, um, <laughs> I, I think I'll let you answer that one, given that um, uh, you've most recently done the article on Belsner. Um, but uh, uh, yes, I, I, one of the questions actually referred to this and uh, indicated that surely we're not going to be left uh, seeking our clients' um, uh, uh, indulgence for the shortfall. Um, and of course, the reality is that these costs are between the parties' costs. They are what is recovered between the parties. Um, and subject, of course, to complying with your duties, there's no um, uh, requirement that these be the costs that you fix with your client. Although one might say, that e even after um, Belster, um, there are likely to be increased numbers of solicitor and client disputes that arise from it because costs are fixed and the sorts of um, value of the, the sort of value of case that's covered is far more significant. Um, I, I would have expected, uh, 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 well, uh, I suppose. It, it's going to be a question for cash flow and um, commercial common sense again uh, as to whether or not uh, uh, solicitors are going to want to profit uh, and take the risk that the recovery from their client will be challenged or, or not. Um, uh, but I, I can't see that it's going to be uh, passed without some further challenge. But it's not, it's obviously not set in the rules. These are just between the parties' rules. I, I think you're right. And I think that puts, puts your finger nicely on the point. It's all very well in the PI fixed costs arena for these low value portal claims to have disputes over a few hundred or even a few thousand quid by way of success fee. Once you're dealing with a huge tranche of civil litigation up to 100,000 quid in value and the 68,450 maximum is just a useful contribution to the true costs of that, again, you're going to have um, disputes between solicitor and client, which will fuel this, this, this satellite litigation of um, uh, uh, working out what the costs of the action are and who pays them. Uh, and indeed, to that extent, there will be a double failure. Well, we're coming up to 4.58. Um, so any concluding thoughts, Paul? Um, well, I, I, I think my, my final thoughts are that uh, one one person actually has just asked whether or not we can provide further detail about the clinical negligence twenty five thousand um, pounds scheme. Well, as I understand it, they're still consulting on that and working through it. I don't think it's been set out yet, or even if if there's a consultation paper that is um, out or a, propo a proposal, then I'm not aware of it. But it, uh, in this response, um, the working party take uh, have, have referred to the CJC still doing their work. So um, uh, mo once we know, no doubt that'll be the subject of another another webinar or something like that. Um, my uh, focus on these rules is, uh, I think, probably threefold, and that is um, where the challenges are likely to be, or fourfold, where the challenges are likely to be. Firstly, I think there are likely to be challenges on banding because it's a new concept to us and um, it'll need to be uh, clearly defined. Uh, we should say, that within the intermediate cases, there are 12, uh, there are 12 stages. And um, we know what happens when lawyers argue about stages and uh, words that revolve around staging. Um, I think of Birdnaker, I think of, uh, I think of CADA and the words that deal with, um, uh, the words that, 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 that pertain to when things happen. Um, I suspect there will be arguments about that. The second is what to do about defendant's costs. Um, that's going to be important. Um, it's going to be important to determine what uh, uh, benefits a defendant has over and above the current regime, if any. Um, the third um, it is uh, the Part 36 consequences and how they uh, inure to both claimant and defendant. And the fourth link to that will be this 
concept of fixed benefit for an establishment of a finding of uh, establishing a finding of unreasonable behavior those i think are going to be the four really interesting points in this uh, new regime um uh, i don't think allocation to to track necessarily is going to cause as many problems as allocation to banding within the track but i might be wrong about that what about, what about you andrew well I, I agree with your last point i think you'll be arguing about banding before you issue and you may never issue you'll be arguing about banding on allocation and then when things don't work out as perhaps they might have done you'll be arguing about banding at the end of the case and saying that this has p- particular consequences but the, the more I, I, I think about this, the, the, the more I, I ask myself the question, I understand the position in PI, PI in insurance, uh, because, of course, that's well-travelled ground. But I cannot see who is asking for this outside of PI. You know, who, who really wants all these boundary disputes and um, low-level defamation cases and uh, professional negligence and all the rest of it? dealt with in this way? And is it really um, grounded by some other almost accidental agenda, such as the fact that many judges don't like cost budgeting? Um, is, is it as simple as that? I, I don't know. But um, I've really enjoyed today, Paul, and thank you. And I'd like to thank our, thank our, our, our participants. We'll be sending out in a week or two the paper. If you've given your email address, then it will come to you. But thanks so much. Uh, for taking part today and we look forward to seeing you many of you um, later this week uh, at the ACL conference so absolutely good night from me (laughs) and it's a good night from me thank you very much everyone thank you for your time thanks a lot bye-bye